It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. I'm back in Shanghai after about eight days in Australia. You may be wondering why I was out there in Sydney, Australia. Well, long story, you'll find out later, but I'm back. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the Coach. Our first question comes from Shoner, who says, Isn't Sanda technically a form of Kung Fu? If you're not familiar with Sanda, it is basically Chinese kickboxing with throws and takedowns. Is it Kung Fu? Yes and no. Yes, because technically everything done at an expert level is Gong Fu in China. Gong Fu means great skill, hard work, talent. And it doesn't just apply to martial arts. It's not just Chinese martial arts. If you have great skill in something, that is Gong Fu. Kung Fu. Sanda is a mixed martial art originally invented to allow various Chinese martial arts practitioners of different styles to compete against each other, to allow grapplers and strikers and hybrid styles to compete against each other on the same platform. Today in the modern world, at the Sanda camps in China, at the Chinese sports universities, these guys cross-train in a bunch of different disciplines, in boxing, in wrestling, in Chinese folk wrestling, in Taekwondo, in Karate, in Muay Thai. Whatever will give them the biggest advantage, not specifically or exclusively Chinese traditional martial arts. So is Sanda Kung Fu? Yes and no. Next question. Our next question comes from Robert, who says, how long does it take to spar in Muay Thai? Depending on the rounds, it could be three minute rounds, two minute rounds, five minute rounds if you're ambitious, but let's go with three minutes. That's pretty standard. You got three minute rounds. Let's say you want to do three rounds. That'll take you nine minutes to spar. Next question. Our next question comes from Ricardo Leonardo, who says, are you sure you don't have any African in you? Um, well, I, as far as I know, I don't have any ancestors from Africa. I've traced my genealogy back several thousand years, and I have done a DNA test, and uh, yeah, no, no African ancestors. So, don't know why that's relevant, but uh, that's, that's how it is. Next question from O. Crawford. Hey, coach, do you think it makes sense to pull guard in a tournament for safety. There's a lot, lot more than this. I'll read the rest. From what, I have, from what I have observed at my white belt level, I see a lot of dangerous and poor executed attempts at takedowns. Yeah, white belts are the worst, man. They're absolutely the worst, and they're a danger to themselves and others. I also think that due to the explosive and quick nature of takedowns, well, some takedowns, you have less time to react to if something starts going wrong, which increases the odds of injury for both you and your opponent. I am solidly in the master's division. That means the older guys, if you're not familiar with BJJ tournaments, master's division is the older guys. And I don't quite bounce like I used to, so I'm inclined to focus on developing a good guard pull for tournaments while continuing to improve takedowns in the gym so I will be ready for the streets. Thank you for your time and producing these excellent and informative videos. Thank you very much for the question. Is guard pulling safer than takedowns? Let's first distinguish guard pulling from guard jumping. Jumping guard, in other words, throwing your legs around the dude and dragging him to the floor is one of the most dangerous things you can do in a BJJ tournament and the biggest legal cause of catastrophic knee injury. So don't do that. And it's also not legal at the white belt level. Pulling guard, meaning you grab the other guy and you sit into a guard. That's legal. That's fine. If that's your strategy in a BJ tournament, more power to you. If you know how to avoid the other guy scoring on you and score on him from your guard, great. Do that. It's a viable option in a BJJ tournament. It's not a viable option in an MMA fight, but in a BJJ tournament, go for it. Next question. Isrocco39 says, Ramsey, what do you think about venom spats? I've used one pair of venom spats. 
uh, what was it? It was like the Red Viper. I don't remember the exact name. But here I'll show them up on the screen here. Show these spats in action. I liked them, but they weren't perfect. The material was very, very thin. There was no drawstring. I, I actually put my own drawstring in there. So if you've got spats and they don't have a drawstring and you want one because they keep slipping down, get a shoestring, a shoelace, thread it through the waistband. You can make your own. So after a slight modification, they, they were decent spats. I loved the way they looked. They looked great. But uh, as far as actual quality, not the greatest that I've tried. Nappy Headed says, does your wife like you more with or without the beard? My wife hates it when I grow a beard. Every time I try to kiss her with a beard, she's like, ah, it's like being attacked by a cactus. Get off me or like a porcupine. So no, she doesn't like the beard. But man, this thing just keeps sprouting back, keeps popping out. One week and boom, I got a beard. So what do you do about it? Next question from Imp Circa 1988 it says, hey, Ramsey, you've spoken a couple of times about how your faith informs your martial arts practice. But I wonder, how have other aspects of your life, dance, combat, sports, parenting, travel, etc., but particularly martial arts, informed your faith? That's an interesting question. There is crossover in everything that we do. In everything that we do, there is. So, I teach Sunday school at church, and I often find myself drawing on personal experiences when teaching lessons because anecdotes are powerful teaching tools and since the bulk of my life experience involves martial arts training coaching fighting etc i often find myself drawing on that experience to form these anecdotes to illustrate scriptural gospel doctrinal examples so yeah man there is crossover like this with everything. Essentially, life is a series of stories that we tell and stories that we've experienced and stories that we communicate to others. And the way we communicate these stories is through our experiences. It's impossible to see what we haven't experienced. A lot of people get that backwards. They say seeing is believing. No, that's not actually true. Not scientifically, not metaphysically. Seeing is not believing, believing is seeing, meaning we are only able to see what we have already experienced. Think about that. Next question. Mr. Moth says, could you do an interview or podcast with President Xi Jinping? Um, President Xi Jinping, probably not. I, I love the energy, Mr. Moth. I, I love the enthusiasm. I don't even know what I would say to the president of China, if you're not familiar. It, it's funny, I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts, many of which are, are of a political nature, and they often reference President Xi Jinping, but they always mispronounce his name and call him something like President Xi. Like, who the heck is President Xi? Oh, they're just mispronouncing Xi Jinping. Xi, the X in Han Yu Pinyin, in the romanization, the modern romanization of Chinese, the X makes a shh sound. Sh as in she, right? You'll find that in other words like shall, which means little or small, right? Shall. Anyway, it's a shh sound. Next question. Sifu Paul Hernandez, uh, Wing Chun dude, says, Hey, Ramsey, thanks for the video. Any chances of giving advice? Sure, why not? What's the question? Can you recommend where I can purchase online a decent speed bag? Okay. I'm not experienced enough to know which is or isn't a good system. I purchased one that is rather... I forget, rather forget than remember, sorry for the hassle. Okay. When asked about online purchases, a lot of people see some of the gear that I use, and I get most of my stuff from Taobao, which is a Chinese uh, shopping online system. So if you don't live in mainland China, that's probably not an option for you. But I'll give you a few specifics about a speed bag. You want a solid frame, one that doesn't shake around or move. So, two things, the thicker the backboard, the thicker the backboard, the heavier the backboard, the better it's going to be, the more stable it's going to be. The thicker and heavier and less movable 
the frame that is bolted to the wall or whatever you bolt your speed bag frame to, the better it's going to be. You don't want it to move or shake. If it's light, thin, shaky, you're going to have some problems with it. A big problem comes with most of the adjustable stands where you can raise them and lower them. And I understand why you would want that because you're going to have some shorter guys and some smaller guys and taller guys, etc. So you want them to be able to adjust it. I personally would recommend, unless you have a really solid frame that's adjustable, don't get one of those because they're, they tend to suck and they tend to shake a lot more. Instead, get a fixed bag, hang it higher, and then get some mats, like um, a stack of those cheap puzzle mats, and then stand on those for the shorter guys. Have the shorter guys stand on those so they can reach the speed bag. You want the, the bag itself to be about maybe a, an inch or two above your chin, so you're kind of reaching up at it a little bit, not too much. You don't want it above your eyes, but just slightly above the chin. That's, that's a perfect height for a speed bag. So adjust it from the ground up rather than from down there. Second, you want to look at the swivel. The swivel is super important. It's probably, besides the frame itself, the most important part of the speed bag. When I started learning speed bag, I learned on a terrible chain link swivel that was probably broken. I didn't know any better. I struggled through it and I thought, man, the speed bag is so hard. When I replaced the swivel with a U-bolt swivel, oh man, it was like, this is incredibly easy. What the heck? Why would they make that other type? Anyway, there are a bunch of different swivels. The longer the swivel, the bigger the arc is going to be. The slower the speed bag will move, the more power you will have to hit the speed bag with to make it move. The third part is the bag itself. The smaller the bag, the quicker it's going to move. Speed bags come in different weights too. Like a leather speed bag will weigh more than a, um, an artificial fabric speed bag or a, a polyurethane speed bag, for example. The lighter the speed bag, the quicker it's going to move with less power. The heavier the speed bag, the, uh, you're going to have to hit it harder to make it move. So I like a heavier speed bag. I like a speed bag that I have to hit harder to make it move because I appreciate the power development factor of the speed bag. Developing that quick, short range pop at the final couple of inches of your punch. That's, that's valuable to me. So given all those factors, solid frame, good swivel, try out a few of them. And a good solid speed bag. You don't have to break the bank on this. It doesn't have to be super expensive. You can get some nice, effective, cheap stuff. And you can spend a lot of money on some crap. So again, I'm sorry I don't have just like a link by this one or by that one or by the other one. But uh, yeah, pay attention to how solid the construction is. Next question. Our next question comes from Tsehopo Ketolo, Ket Kotelo, okay, who says, as a Christian, can I learn Salat because it comes from Islam? I would never convert to Islam, but Salat is one of the most effective martial arts I've seen, and it complements kickboxing, which I've spent three years learning and will return to. Okay, so our friend has had a positive experience with Salat with Indonesian martial arts. He thinks it's worth investing some time into, but he's worried because he's a devout Christian and he's worried about Islamic traditions and so on. Well, here's a question. As a Christian, do you learn algebra? Have you learned algebra in math class? Or were you like, no, that's, that's an Islamic tradition. That came from Islam. So I, I can't learn that. No, no, mathematics. I'm not down with that. No, oh, man. Look, obviously, if, if, you, if you think about it for a minute, mathematics, algebra, all of these uh, cultural additions to the world that came from, from Islam, of which are many in terms of architecture, mathematics, martial arts, medicine, etc., they can't be ignored. But if, if we tell ourselves, oh, I'm not going to do that because, because it wasn't a Christian that invented that, 
that's kind of silly to me. Jesus never once said, Thou shalt not learn useful things developed by non-Christians. I, I don't think that was in the agenda, man. So if you find value in Salat or anything that comes from anyone not of your culture, not of your religion, etc., great. Add that to your game, man. Add that to your game. You don't have to become a Muslim to appreciate what they have to offer to the world. All right, next question. Michael says, question, does the thought of shouting out advice to both fighters ever come up when this close to a fight? Okay, he left this on a short video clip I left on my YouTube story. I was in Thailand a couple of weeks ago. I was in Bangkok, went to Ratchadamnurn Stadium and sat up in the front row, hanging out with my brother. That week he lives in Bangkok and uh, just put up a, a little clip of a cool part of this fight that I saw. I pulled out my camera. So he asked, does that impulse to give advice to the fighters come to me? Not unless I'm coaching. To me, that's work. That's a job. When I go to watch a fight, I'm watching the fight. I'm enjoying it. I'm digesting it. If, you know, the, the thought of trying to coach when it's not my job to do so, that, that's not in my programming. I know a lot of people feel like that. They watch a fight and they just want to be like, kick him in the head. If I was in there, I'd kick him in the head, punch him in the face, stop hugging him. And as, as a guy who's been there and done that and listened to all these all these armchair coaches shout to the fighters. It's obnoxious. It's annoying. I hate it. I don't appreciate that. I don't like it. I understand why you're doing it, but eh, does it occur to me to do that? To do that? No, absolutely not. Next question. Our next question comes from Francisco, who says, "Would you say wrestling is the most universal way of fighting?" Yeah, I would. Wrestling is absolutely the most universal way of fighting. All cultures across the world have independently developed their own styles of wrestling, their own styles of grappling. And the rules vary, but it's all grappling, it's all wrestling at the end of the day. So yeah, absolutely the most universal. Bob Mango sends in this question, Ramsey, what is your relationship between thinking and feeling during a fight or a sparring session? Do you think your next move or do you react? Or do you feel, perhaps, what is your mind like during a fight? I'd, I'd like to know what you think. Thanks. All right, Bob Mango, that's, that's an interesting question. There are a lot of different ways to, to think. If you asked me this question like 20 years ago, I probably would have said, well, you, you, you just kind of go on autopilot and react and you're not really thinking. And by thinking back then, what I would have meant is cognitive processes at, at a certain level. My, my wife is has recently become very heavily invested in learning about philosophy. And one aspect of that is learning about thinking. So she's made a chart of 50, what she calls thinking moves, thinking moves. And they're, they're just different modes of thinking, different ways to think. I'll give you a couple of examples. I won't list all 50, obviously, in the interest of time. But I want you to think about the past. Think about what you did yesterday. Okay, that's, that's one mode of thinking, thinking about the past, reflecting about the past, remembering. Okay, now I want you to think about what you are going to do tomorrow. Think about what you are going to do tomorrow. We're now planning for the future. We're thinking in an abstract, something that hasn't even happened yet, but we're planning it. Maybe what you're go when you're going to wake up, maybe when you're going to work, if you're going to go to work, right? Maybe you have a project you're planning on doing, someone you're planning on meeting, right? These things haven't happened yet, but we're thinking about it. These are two different modes of thinking. These are not the same. They're not. Here's another thing. Think about your index finger, right? Think about your index finger, just that. How it moves, the texture of it, whether or not your fingernails need clipping or not. Think about the index finger, right? And now I want you to think about the entire universe at large. Think about the entire observable universe, everything you know about the universe right now. Think about the stars, think about the planets, think about the space, think about quantum physics, think about everything. Now, are those the same thing? 
we're zooming in when we think about the finger. We're zooming out when we think about the whole world, right? These are two different methods of thinking. Now, when we fight, there are probably five, six, maybe seven different modes of thinking that are happening at the same time. And they're very different than the modes of thinking that are transpiring while you're watching this video. Because you're thinking, it's a little bit more passive, maybe a lot more passive, because you're simply hearing what the talking head guy on the internet is saying to you. But it's a different mode of thinking than, say, if you're making a video and, and you're speaking and answering a question. But it's still thinking. There's still cognitive processes happening. There's still certain levels of kinesthetic bodily intelligence going on, certain levels of emotional intelligence going on, etc. There are lots of different modes and methods of thinking and expressions of intelligence. So in a fight, it's definitely different. It's something that I would describe as feeling. Somebody asked me, what, what does it feel like when, when like you're in the zone and it's going well when you're fighting, which is a very different thing when it's not going well. Right? If you're pinned and you can't move and the other guy's dropping elbows on you, boom, boom, that, that, that just feels like this sucks and I can't wait for it to end. Whereas if you're in the zone and your plan is working and, and you're moving the way that you want and, and it's all working out really well, it's, it feels like light. It feels like you're just filled with light. And it's, it's not like any specific words or images are going on. It's, it's like you're moving the way you want to move. It's happening the way you want it to happen. It's, it's, a, it's a great feeling. Okay. So that's a fascinating question. I, I would love to discuss this with my wife, actually, and have her diagram how, how this type of thinking works, according to, according to uh, modern philosophy. Anyway, next question. Sitsa says, Ramsey, if you read this, which I am right now, please make a video, which I am right now, on what martial art is best for getting up, standing up from takedowns between judo, wrestling, BJJ, etc. Wrestling. Why? It's the art of position. It's the offensive aspect of grappling. Why did I not pick judo and BJJ? Well, they're great arts, and, and if you take those classes from somebody competent, they will teach you get-ups from bad positions, but in terms of BJJ, generally we are going to accept the bottom position and fight from there, as opposed to Wrestling, where the emphasis is be the guy on top, dictate the position, impose your will. So, man. And it's also technically something that's addressed far more in the sport of wrestling than it is in those other sports. Sita has one more question. Now, since I listened to the video itself, what is the empirical evidence for God not using reasons or opinions but hardcore proof? This was a comment on a video titled Advice for an, an Agnostic Afraid of the Unknown. Okay, so you want empirical evidence for God? That's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about what empirical evidence and hardcore proof actually is. I want you to consider for a moment your senses, the sense of sight. This is the one that we consider empirical evidence. And you might think, well, no, no, it's more than that. No, it's, it's not. It really is that simple. Empirical evidence, as we understand it, is limited to one single sense, the sense of sight. The entire field of astronomy, astrophysics, etc., based on that one sense, empirical evidence from the sense of sight. Astronomy is the study of light. Light traveling to our eyes. Now, if you were able to hear something or smell that thing or feel it with your hands or taste it, you might say, well, well that's evidence, that's, that's proof of, that something exists, right? Except, how do you calculate that? I had an experience the other day. I mentioned I was just in Australia. I was uh, doing a project with Rokas from the Martial Arts Journey Channel, Icy Mike from the Hard to Hurt Channel, Jeff Chan from MMA Shredded, and Sensei Seth from his eponym eponymous Sensei Seth channel. Anyway, so we're hanging out one day, and they take out a jug of juice, and Icy Mike pours himself a glass of this juice, and he tastes it. And 
I've never seen anybody this ecstatic about drinking juice before. He took a sip and he was like, this is the greatest juice I've ever tasted in my life. Ah, there was exuberance, light just beaming from his eyes. He had a transcendent experience drinking this juice. Jeff Chan gets a glass and he tastes it and he's like, mm, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. You know, a, an underwhelming reaction compared to Mike's. And then I taste it and I'm like, it's a bit on the sour side. Hmm. It's not really my thing. And so we, we have three guys experiencing the exact same stimulus, this juice. One, to one guy, it's the greatest experience of his life. To the other, it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's okay. And to me, it's like, ah, I don't really like it that much. It's too sour. So how do we calculate that? Now, we could calculate our sense of taste. We, we, could, um, we could try to do it empirically. We could observe the, the chemical formula of the juice and, and maybe, maybe try to extrapolate the, the chemical composition of our tongues and our bodies and our neurochemistry and write up some charts and, and try to see it. But at the end of the day, that's all we're trying to do is see it. Relying on that one single sense, seeing the data, seeing the numbers seeing the math, and that's it. So, I have no idea what, what Mike tasted when he drank that juice. I just know he had a super positive experience. I don't know what Jeff tasted when he tasted that juice. All I know is he had a kind of mediocre experience. I just know that when I tasted it, it was too sour and I didn't really care for it. So who's right? Who's right? Was it the greatest juice ever? Was it mediocre or was it, eh, was it too sour? Maybe it was all three. Because that's a subjective experience. Now you're asking for an objective, you're asking for objective data, empirical data. You're asking me to prove God to you. I've got a better idea. If you, if you want someone to prove God to you, how about have God prove God to you. Think, think about that for a minute. Because how can Ramsey Dewey prove God to you? I can tell you about experiences I've had. I can tell you about, about spiritual confirmations I've had to let, to, that have led me to believe that God is real and so on, but I can't just give those over to you on a silver platter in the exact same way that I can't just, I can't just give you the experience I had of drinking this juice that was too sour for me and the best thing ever for Mike. It doesn't work that way, man. It's something you have to experience yourself so that you can know for yourself. And that's it, man. That's it. If we are, in fact, spiritual beings living and inhabiting a physical body, this physical body has senses, taste, sight, etc., would it not also stand to reason, if that is the case, that this spiritual being inhabiting this body also has spiritual senses. Remember what the Gospel of John says, God is spirit. And because of that, he is able to communicate with our spirit. And as the Apostle Paul wrote, we are the children of God, and therefore, the Spirit of God is able to speak to our spirit that we are his children, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if it so be that we suffer with him. That's not something you will be able to see with these eyes, man. Maybe with this one. Maybe with this one, wherever, wherever your spiritual senses are located, man. So that's something to think about. That's something to think about. Great question. I love it. Next question. Roma says, how is your knee? Uh, my knee hurts. Hurts a lot. I have a bit of a knee injury, so I'm dealing with that right now. Oh, wait. This was a joke. It was a reference. Okay. This, this was on a post. I was really excited about this. I'm in an Elder Scrolls game, guys. Did you know this? I made it into an Elder Scrolls game. As a mod, I know, but I'm in Morrowind, the best Elder Scrolls game of them all. If you go to, I think it's Nexus uh, Mods, I think it's called, you can download a mod where I appear as an NPC 
in the city of Balmora. And you can learn. I'm a master hand-to-hand -hand trainer, hand-to-hand -hand combat trainer for the hand-to-hand -hand skill in Morwen in the city of Balmora. So if you want to experience that, go download it. I think my NPC even ends every conversation with, now get out there and train. It's awesome. I'm super stoked about that. So I think that's a Skyrim joke. I used to be an adventurer like you, but then I took an arrow to the knee. But my knee actually is injured this week. So dealing with that. Next question from Ape. Ape. Okay. Ape and nothing else. This question isn't really related to the video, but I thought you would be the man to ask, do you think that someone could create and run a company while being a professional fighter? Do you have to go all in on one or can you do both? Well, yeah. Yeah, you can do both. I know professional fighters who work full-time. I was a professional fighter who worked full-time. Can you run a company? Yeah, a lot of them do. How many professional fighters run a gym? A lot of them. A lot of that's a company. How many professional fighters work full-time or part-time on the side to support themselves? A lot of them. Most of them. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, now you do. So can you do it? You can. Is it optimal? Not always. Is it preferable to devote all your time and talent and energy and attention to the thing you want to succeed at the most? Yeah, that's preferable. Is it always possible? No, unfortunately. Ladybug sends in this question. I need to lose five pounds in a week and a half for a tournament. What can I do to lose that weight? Well, how you're going to lose that weight depends on if it is the same day weigh-ins or day before weigh-ins. Day before weigh-ins is easy because then you can sweat it off the day before and spit in a bucket, sweat a little bit, pee, poop, you're fine, right? If it's the same day weigh-ins, right before the tournament, for example, BJJ tournaments are usually like this. You weigh in right before you compete. You've got to be smarter about the way you do it. So. So you've got how long? How long? Hold on. What did you say? I forgot already. So you have a week and a half before the tournament. This question was sent eight days ago. So we might be a little too late for that gradual, gradual weight loss. Essentially, you're going to start restricting a little bit of water, a little bit of food. That's, that's, what, that's what you can hope for in a few days. So think about how much food weight-wise that you ingest each day. You, you could try fasting completely for a couple of days, but you're, that's going to leave you very low energy. So, so a little bit of restriction as far as weight of food, okay, before the tournament. Um, and a little bit of restriction as far as water goes. That's, that's about the best you're going to get in a couple of days before a tournament where you have to weigh in the day before. Uh, make sure that you put it back on before the tournament. As far as water, you don't want to compete dehydrated. You don't want to compete low on salt. So if you're restricting water, salt, and food, etc., make sure before the tournament you, you rehydrate, get your electrolytes back in, Eat some salt, drink some gator, eat, eat some bananas, have some Pedialyte, whatever gets some electrolytes back in you. That's just salts dissolved in water. And anytime we, we do some sort of rapid weight loss, weight cutting, generally we're losing electrolytes in the body. So you need to replace those. So, our fast people, Joe K sends this one, our fast people genetically gifted, is there a way to get faster? Are fast people genetically gifted? Sometimes, some of them certainly are. Is there a way to get faster? Yes, but there's a limit to how much faster we're going to get. We're talking about like maybe a 5% increase in our total speed. You're not going to become incredibly faster. Of course, that depends on what we're talking about. There was a, a short video clip I saw recently. I think it's up on the Viking Samurai channel, an interview with Frank Dukes and... Frank was replying to something that, that Michael Bisping said. Michael Bisping made a video kind of poking some, some fun at Frank Dukes, saying, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's made all these outlandish claims. Let's debunk them. And rightfully so, because he has made a bunch of outlandish claims. But one claim 
that Frank pointed out that was really not that outlandish was his kicking speed. Here's the issue. Michael Bisping pointed to Frank Duke's claim of kicking speed and said, oh, he claims he can kick faster than a cheetah can run. And Frank Dukes replied and said, I hope you're not confusing this with the idea that I can run faster than a cheetah. Moving a kick, a single leg, in that single explosive motion is not the same thing as running at that particular speed. So they pointed out some other martial artists who are easily able to move their legs that fast for a single kick. It's, it's not quite the same thing, right? So as far as increasing speed for one quick powerful motion like boom, a punch or a kick, that's a very different thing than moving your whole body around extremely quickly. Like a sprinter or a, uh, a football player moving laterally and then back again very quickly. Can you do it? Eh, yeah, but anyway, wait, there was more to this question. I know that speed is not as significant as position. That's correct. If you're in the right position, you don't have to be super fast. But I feel like it would be easier to get into a position more easily as well as exploit opportunities. So, so how do you actually get faster? Practice the movements that you want to be good at. So strength weighs into speed a lot. Lift weights get strong, but you have to use that strength in explosive and quick ways in order to be fast. So do your deadlifts, do your squats, but also do your sprints. For example, if you, do, if you do those three exercises concurrently, then you will be able to use that strength in that explosive, fast, quick way you're looking for. What else? How about plyometric jumps? Yeah, that, that's a speed movement. That's an application of strength and power in a very quick way, right? So squats and deadlifts by themselves, they will make you stronger, but not faster. But we can translate that strength into speed if we apply it as such. So a plyometric jump is a great way to move your legs and have this massive speedy contraction into your core and then back again. What else? How about punching and kicking themselves? If you want to get faster at punching and kicking, practice that. But there's a little more. Your strikes will only move as quickly as your breath and your feet. It's true. So if your feet are glued to the floor, your punches will be sluggish and slow. If your feet move, now your punches can move as fast as your feet do. If you're holding your breath, your punches will be sluggish and slow. If you breathe and exhale with your strikes, they're going to be so much better, so much quicker, and so much more fluid. So there are a few things you can do right now. If you're not doing them already, it will make you faster quicker, speedier, and a few things you can do in the long run. Next question comes from Shane Bodnar. This was a reply to my video, karate won't work in MMA until you learn how to box, where he said, doesn't karate teach punches? Well, yes, karate does teach punches, Hiya! but it does not teach boxing. There's an important difference. Boxing is the art of position on your feet that you need to land the punches. Karate is a traditional martial art where they will teach you systematically forms and specific movements that are not boxing. Some of those movements are punches, but it's not boxing. Important distinction. Next question. Kanat Kaskun says, Ramsey, for me, you are a true martial artist and a good Christian. From my perspective, I'm going to take. One issue with that phrase, good Christian. Remember when Jesus himself, when a young man approached him and said, good master, Jesus cut him off and said, why callest thou me good? There is one good, and that is God alone. Even Jesus, who was perfect in Christian theology, was perfect, took issue with being called good. Isn't that interesting? So why do we say good Christian? That's such a common term in the world today. Oh, he's a good Christian. Ah, there's none good but God in Christian theology. So let's, uh, let's nip that in the bud. Anyway, so we, I'll just take that as you think I'm a decent human being. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Why not? 
I wasn't born in a Christian nation or a cultural one, but I really do wonder what do you think about just war? At the end, Jesus said, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Do you think, si vis pacem parabellum, if you search for peace, prepare for war? From my rough translation, does this apply to this philosophy? I hope one day I will be able to travel to China and train with you uh, through your philosophy in accordance to both martial arts and Christianity. When I finish my medical education here in Turkey, I would love to read your comment on this comment. Love and respect from my country. All right. Um, Kankat, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I do not speak Turkish. I do have a, a few Turkish friends here in, in Shanghai. Nice, nice dudes, man. So is there such a thing as a just war? Hmm. When was the last just war that everybody, generally speaking, was on board with? Probably the one most people would think of as being a just war would be World War II. At least the way it's framed in modern history books. We had the axis of evil trying to conquer the world and do horrible things and, and commit genocides and atrocities, and then everybody else was trying to stop them, right? So generally, we tend to think of World War II as, as like the last just war. But any war, any war, we're talking about large-scale violence. And large-scale violence is largely uncontrollable, unpredict unpredictable, and we're going to see atrocities no matter what. On a small scale, it's, easy to it's easier to justify violence. For example, self-defense. Self-defense literally means... It, it, is, it is a legal term that literally means justifying violent action that would otherwise be illegal in a court of law. So if a bad guy comes out and tries to hurt me, and I hurt him in self-defense to stop him from harming me, it is possible that I can justify that in a court of law as being legal. Whereas if I just walk up to that guy and I punch him and he's no threat to me or others, then that's not justifiable, right? So on a small scale, we call this self-defense. On a large scale, that's, that's where it starts getting complicated and iffy, right? Is there such thing as a just war? In the world today, probably not. It is easy, at least easier, to imagine in your mind a hypothetical just war. You can imagine, like, we, we see this a lot in the movies. And the movies have to be very careful about who they cast as the villains. Often they're, they are very one-sided, cartoonish, pure, evil, faceless characters who, who just have the worst of intentions, and we can all agree, these guys need to be stopped. These guys need to be put down. I mean, think, think about all the, the Marvel movies, for example. We have Thanos coming, and he wants to wipe out half of the universe, and everybody can agree, okay, this, this, he's a bad guy. He needs to be stopped. Half the universe doesn't want to die. Let's, let's stop this guy. And his soldiers, he, he brings in these CGI aliens, and they're all the same guy. They all have no face. They just want to kill, 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 so we don't feel bad when the alien soldiers die. But when the heroes die, what happens? The people that we, we associate ourselves with, oh, we feel bad, oh, it's sad, oh, boo-hoo, wah. But as far as real wars that have happened here on Earth, what are they? Human beings killing human beings. Is there evil in this world? Heck yes, there is. Is there evil at play in the course of warfare? Absolutely. Is there evil on both sides? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. I don't have a simple answer to this complex question, my friend. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Jesus said that to Peter. They were in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. He said, I will, I will kiss the one that you want. 
to take. The Roman soldiers went to grab him. Peter drew his sword, chopped off the ear of one of the soldiers. Jesus put his hand on the severed ear and healed him with his power. And he spoke to Peter. He said, no, 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 put that away. Put that away. It's not necessary. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. And this is in stark contrast to something that Jesus said previously, before they had left to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was telling the apostles, okay, look, the times that are going to come are not going to be pleasant times. It's going to be rough. If you don't already have a sword, sell your cloak and go buy one. And so a lot of people look at that. That's paradoxical. He was just telling them, prepare for war. And right here he's telling Peter, it's not the time. Isn't that interesting? So by that we learn there is a time and a place for violence. At that specific time in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was about to do something which would lead to fulfilling his mission, That was not the time for violence. But previously, when he admonished his apostles, if you don't have a sword already, go sell your cloak and buy one, because perilous times are coming, my friends. We can interpret that a couple of ways. There will be a time for violence. There will be a time for struggle. We can also look at that in a metaphorical way. In other words, it's going to get a lot rougher than you expected it to. Let's look at another question. Terminator. Ooh. Terminator says, how to maintain and improve anaerobic conditioning, long duration, explosive power, three minute rounds when adding weights to my training. I was going to say add weights to your training because that's going to help a lot, but it almost sounds like you feel like adding weights to your training is making it more difficult to maintain and improve anaerobic conditioning. That's kind of odd, because that that is exactly what I would recommend you do. Add more weights to your training if you feel like your anaerobic capacity is low. And if you're already weightlifting, follow the principle of progressive overload. Keep using the minimum effective dose to get stronger every day. Next question, Rez Vero says, I could beat you in a fight, exclamation point. That's not a question, but Rez says, I could beat you in a fight. Hmm. Cool. You must be amazing. Next question. All right. A Terminator left another comment on a, uh, a video that I made about the athletic crossover between strength training and boxing. And he was surprised that I did not recommend bench presses for boxing. Now, I won't tell you not to bench press, right? Bench pressing won't make you worse at boxing. Anything that makes you a better athlete makes you a better fighter, okay? But here's why why I specifically didn't say boxers should bench press. Bench pressing is something boxers should do. No, I don't think it is. Here's why. The bench press has minimal athletic crossover to boxing, minimal athletic crossover to punching specifically. A lot of people feel like extending the arms away from the body as one does in a bench press is similar to extending the arm away from the body for a punch. But you have to remember a punch is not a push. A punch is not a chest contraction. A punch is not an arm extension. It it, it is. We are extending the arm. But the body mechanics behind a punch involve pulling the opposite shoulder back while transferring the weight from one leg to the other leg. That is the main generator of power in a punch. That is the main generator of efficacy in a punch, pulling the opposite shoulder back. So for example, if I have got my left arm extended right here, and I want to punch with my right hand, what am I going to do to generate the most possible power and make this the most athletic punch possible? I will pull my left shoulder back. As I extend my right arm, it has nothing to do with pushing force. Nothing to do with a chest press. Absolutely nothing. So 
What else? The legs. In this video, I recommended squats and deadlifts and sprints. These exercises that make your legs stronger, that improve our connection to the earth below us. Why? Because boxing, as I mentioned before, has everything to do with transferring weight in an explosive athletic way from one foot to the other, from one leg to the other, from one hip to the other, while pulling the opposite shoulder back, right? So I would recommend, besides squats and deadlifts, pulling exercises. Pulling exercises have so much more athletic crossover to boxing than pushing exercises. If you like bench pressing, great. Don't stop. It won't make you worse. But as I said before, it doesn't have the type of athletic crossover you think. Next question from Joseph Dewey. That, that's my brother. My brother watches my YouTube channel. Finally. Yes, I have arrived. So a question. Which martial arts performers can do the splits better or more splittily than Jean-Claude Van Damme? Oh, okay. Interesting question. All right. Jean-Claude Van Damme is a master of the side splits. And I don't know how his front splits are, but his side splits and his box splits, great. If you want to see good front splits, though, look at Chinese actors. Jackie Chan, great front split. Uh, Zhang Ziyi, great front split. Mm. That's all I can think of off the top of my head that I've seen do front splits on screen. So, yeah. Are they better at the side splits than, than Van Damme? I, I don't know. Maybe not. Van Damme may have the best side splits in the business. Either him or those, uh, those guys they got to replace Van Damme in the straight-to-video sequels of Bloodsport that nobody watched. Okay. And we're out of questions. All right. If you have a question for the next edition of Q&A with the Coach, just leave it in the comments down below with a question mark. Make sure it's just not a life story. Hey, coach, I have a question. Here's my entire life story. No actual question. I get that a lot. So make sure there's a question in your question. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.